1540, Northern Germany, somebody comes up with the idea of a snop house, is a flintlock weapon. It uses a flint striking a frizzen to ignite a powder charge. There are several variations of that. By 1640, you have what is a flintlock musket in the format that you're looking at here. 1640, 1700, <coughs> 1700, this would be the weapon of war. When Churchill led the British at the Battle of Blenheim, the first Duke of Marlborough, his troops were carrying a very early version of the Brown Vest. Not quite the first land pattern that would come out in 1728. The troops at the Battle of Waterloo are going to be carrying this musket. This is a India pattern brown vest, a standard weapon of the British infantry up until Waterloo. Now, our story takes an interesting turn, not with a great military weapons designer or anyone of great note. Who knows Alexander Forsyth? I've heard the name. Necessity is the mother of invention. And for a Presbyterian minister to go out and do something and have his powder charge go off and the geese scatter and good expensive powder and shot go to waste is a necessity. The year is 1808, and our good reverend is goose hunting. Pulls the trigger, flash in the pan, powder goes off, delayed charge, gun goes off, the target's flown. He needs a better gun. He goes back, and, and being a man of the cloth, and reading journals not only theological but scientific, discovered people playing with something called fumigate. He patents the percussion cap. His patent of the percussion cap immediately leads to every military force abandoning all their flintlocks and rushing headlong, not, into a dog pit. It is going to take about 30 years for the militaries to fully adopt the percussion technology. So for example, this is a U.S. model, and it actually is dated 1809, so it's one year after the percussion cap comes out, it is a standard flintlock musket. And you'll start seeing the military as they adopt. They have these stores of all these wonderful old military muskets, and they start converting them. This is an example of a conversion. You notice how the place where the pan would be has been welded in, and this is called barrel in conversion, where they put the nipple straight into the barrel, put the percussion cap, and fire it. What's neat about this is this is dated 1841. It's dated 1841. This was not made as a flintlock, or not made as a percussion cap gun. This was converted. This was originally in 1841 by the United States Armory at Harper's Ferry made as a flintlock musket. We didn't start producing a cap gun until 1841 as our standard infantry weapon. We did, however, start producing a cap gun for our riflemen. Now, for those of you who do Civil War, have you ever heard of Verdan's guy talk about how revolutionary the Verdan's sharpshooters were? They weren't. The United States had adopted rifled infantry in green jackets prior to the War of 1812. Because of the expense of the uniforms, they changed over to hunting frocks. But the United States had always had riflemen in their regiments, riflemen in the army. Going back to the Revolutionary War, Daniel Morgan's rifleman, 1st Pennsylvania, 2nd Maryland, rifles. What makes this one rather neat is this little funny little hook there. This is a breech loader. And the original design in 1819 
was a flintlock. In 1832, we're starting to produce these as cap lock, percussion cap. Powder charge and ball, cap, fire. Also notice it's, the sight on this is offset to allow the uh, hammer to operate. So we're starting that evolution from the percussion from the flint block into the percussion cap. Now, doing some research on this, I came across something bizarre that I had never known. Does the name Samuel Johann Pauli strike anyone? Samuel Johann Pauli was a gunsmith working in France in 1808, coincidence. He patents a rifle. The rifle is a breech loader. The mechanism is a firing pin. The cartridge is a copper cartridge containing fumigate, powder, and ball. It is the first modern cartridge. No one has any idea how to produce these things in mass or any idea how to produce the machinery that might produce these things in mass. It was an idea 30 years ahead of his time. He goes off after the Napoleonic Wars and gets a job with Joyce A. in London as a gunsmith. He has an assistant. His assistant goes to the east and gets a job with one of the minor German states. His name is Nicholas Device. This is a model 1848 Device needle gun. It represents two things. Number one, it uses a paper cartridge because nobody can figure out how to make metal cartridges in 1848. It uses a paper cartridge, but that paper cartridge contains the bullet. The charge, the primer, is actually at the base of the bullet with the powder charge in front of it. To fire it, the gun uses a needle, and you can see that needle that goes all the way through the cartridge. When you load it, Put your cartridge in, and then you push this forward, which drives the needle and cocks the gun. Bang. Uncock. Cartridge. Now compare that to the guy standing with his percussion musket, pouring powder down, putting the bullet in, ramming the bullet all the way down to the seat. Putting the ram on the back, bringing that up, pulling out a percussion cap, and putting that on and firing. So this represents a radical change in technology. The other radical change in technology is going to be credited to a Frenchman by the name of Claude Benet. Claude Benet is going to kill more Americans than any other enemy with an invention, and that invention is the Benet bullet sometimes called the Manet ball. It's actually a bullet, it's not a ball, and it's definitely not a mini. It's a corruption of his name. And this is typical of what the American Civil War would carry. This is a United States Springfield musket manufactured by Savage Arms Company of Connecticut. And this is a typical way, and this is a typical percussion cap firing gun. Um, in British Enfield, all of these would match. Now, the big modification, thanks to Manet, is that this is rifle. Prior weapons were actually going to be smooth bore. He invents a bullet with a hollow base that allows you to load the rifle rapidly. Now, rifling is not actually a new invention, but the bullet allowing you to load it quickly, and then when you fire, the base of the bullet expands captures the rifling and allows it to fire. Prior to that, when you had a rifled weapon, 
you needed to have a patch, you needed to have contact between the bullet and the rifling in order for it to do what it's supposed to do, in order for it to work. Going a little out of my weapon specialty, because these are carbines, uh, this is a Burnside carbine, and as a technology, you can see the relationship between the Burnside, I think, and the Hale Hall rifle. You can see the technology there. The difference is this uses a metallic cartridge, so when you put in the metallic cartridge and close it, you have a gas seal that you don't have with the hull. The nice thing about firing the hull is when you go either, either the flintlock or the percussion version, by loading this you have power all over the place, and when you fire this thing, you have this ball of fire right in front of your eyes. It's a truly wonderful experience. It comes from my lack of eyebrows. The most greatest invention in the American Civil War is the Spencer Carpet. Spencer carbine is a seven shot repeater rifle. Loaded through the breech, seems a little tight, with a magazine. Federal cavalry will have a quiver magazine of 11 of these preloaded, 77 rounds. have just gotten a whole lot deadlier. So the American Civil War, we have the repeating arms. So the concept here is as we're moving forward is the metallic cartridge shown both by the Hall or shown by the Burnside and the Spencer. The metallic cartridge starts to take over. So the dry needle gun is going to also play a key role here because what's going to happen is Germany, Prussia, is going to go to war against the Danes in 1864. The Danes are a very good army, but they're equipped with your standard rifled musket. The Germans are equipped with the Dreis. They overpower them quickly. 1866, Germany goes to war with Austria, runs them ragged in the Seven Weeks' War. Battle of Königsgratz. Austrian infantry attacking German positions, armed with a Dreis needle gunner, slaughtered. One. I can load it a lot quicker. I can load it just as quick here, and I can actually lay down and fire this gun almost as fast as I can load it standing. You can't do that with the rifle musket. The French are watching, and they are going to respond themselves with a bolt-action rifle. This is the Chasse-Paul. It uses a paper cartridge. It is a 45 caliber. It has a firing needle. It will do the same thing but it has a better gas seal and a smaller round, and it's going to outrange the Dreis by about two to one. Demonstrating, of course, that superior ta technology will not often make up for the superior tactics. The French manage to lose the Franco-Prussian War when they have every advantage in technology and firearms. <laughs> American Civil War ends. We want to do cartridges, metallic cartridges, but we do something that's really absolutely interesting in technology is we go backwards. We get very conservative mentality that says, well, we've got all these wonderful old muskets. Let's just adapt them to the new cartridge technology. And so we have things like this. This is a British Enfield Snyder. It's a standard British Enfield from the Civil War style P53, fitted with Jacob Snyder's.
cartridge system. It's a single shot metallic cartridge. Load your cartridge, close it, fire it, open it, extract the cartridge, and then go through the process again. The United States, facing no major enemies of any great concern, adopts this. This is the trapdoor spring seal. Single shot. So, and after getting their butts handed to them in the Seven Weeks War, this is an Austrian variable. So you see a couple of different approaches to the single shot technology. I didn't bring my Remington rolling block, I apologize, but that's another one. So there was several different patents and approaches to that, including in 1871, when the French come out with the Chassepeau. Now, the Chassepeau, is of course an updated version of the uh, the Chassepeau, and this is the Grasse. The Grasse is an updated version of the Chassepeau. It's using a 11 millimeter metal cartridge. Well, if the French are going to come up with a new gun, guess who else has to come up with a new gun? The Germans. <laughs> because you can't let the French get ahead of you. So the Germans respond with the Mauser 71, and this is an example of that. This is the Mauser 71, and this is the Mauser 7184. So everybody's going with a single shot weapon at this point. And actually it's the Swiss, that militaristic country that gets involved in every war that it possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> that actually come up with an idea. Now, during the American Civil War, we had the Henry Repeating Rifle. What the Swiss do is they take the Henry Repeating Rifle and marry it to a bolt action. And so in 1869, they come up with this weapon. It's called the Vetterling, after the design. It uses a metallic cartridge, and it uses the Henry-style loading system adapted with a bolt action. You have a loading gate here. So I can put rounds in there in a tubular magazine, just like you would find on the Winchester repeating rifle. So the Swiss now have the best weapon available. The response to that by the Germans and others is a different loading system called the Kirpachik, named after a Portuguese designer. The Kirpachik uses a tubular magazine, the same, a simpler loading system, a simpler mechanism for loading, just a little lever here. When I close it, the lever drops to allow the next round to come down. When I open it, this gate lifts up, the expend cartridge ejects, and I can now close, and I'm ready to fire. You also notice that when you operate the bolt, it now automatically cocks the gun and makes it ready for firing. The British, being ever innovative, really throw back the clock, and this replaces the British Snyder with the Martini Henry. Really not a great example of weapons technology development, but who hasn't seen Zulu and wants to look at a Martini Henry? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the arms race has really shifted. The United States has dropped out. We're fighting Indian Wars. We've got a 4570, 4570 carbine. Still have some people using Spencers. We've got some Henrys floating around the Winchesters. Not used by the United States Army, but occasionally used by its 
Native Americans. Uh, one of the things that I've often read was how bad the 4570 was, how obsolete it was before it even got to the troops. Obsolete is a comparative term. There was a general retrograde right after the Civil War. I mean, the British are using the Snyder and the Martini Henry, who is our most potential enemy in the 1860s, 1870s? Possibly Britain, not likely, possibly. The Native Americans, what has been said about this, have them having repeating rifles, and everything else. But when you look at what was actually done when they did the surveying of the battlefield at the Little Bighorn, what they find is the Native Americans were carrying everything. Bows and arrows, brown vest muskets, some modern repeating firearms, <clears throat> but the availability of ammunition for them for modern weapons was very limited. What you had was really stupid tactics on the part of General Custer. That's what led to the defeat. Look at what happened with Ben Team. They were able to hold off using that same 4570. Look at the Battle of the Red Butt. They were still able to, even when surprised, be able to defend themselves against an assault. So, it was obsolete in the terms that there were better technologies available, but it was adequate. At least before we got into the little alteration with the folks in Spain. So what we see now is the evolution of the technology. We now have the cartridge. It's a black powder cartridge. And now we're going to move to the next level. And the country that goes nuclear is oddly, oddly the French. This is an 8 millimeter Lebel. This is a 1886 model rifle. It is black powder, not. It is smokeless powder. It is a small bore. It's an 8 millimeter bore. Metallic cartridge. This is actually looked upon as the first true modern rifle because of the fact that it is smokeless powder. It is, using the Kirpachik system again, a multi-round weapon. Five rounds down the tubular magazine. Now, the thing that makes it interesting is that It's using a round point bullet with a center fire cartridge. The way they get around that is it's a rimmed cartridge. That means the rim extends beyond the face of the cartridge so that when these things are lined up, they alternate down the barrel. So you don't have the bullet touching the primer. Because if the bullet was touching the primer, you would have a real bad experience the first time you shot it because every round in your chamber would immediately go off. But this is the first modern firearm, and it's going to lead the French build a gun. What has to happen? The Germans have to build a gun. So the Germans do something terribly un-German. Instead of just getting on the telegraph, and, hey, Paul, as in Paul Mauser, built us a new gun. No, they get a commission together. And they produced the commission rifle. Now, everybody's always heard the joke that a uh, camel is a horse designed by committee. This is the one time a committee gets it right. They get rid of the Kaparchik system and they use a stripper clip. The clip is going to go in with five cartridges. Cartridges are lined up so that fire, 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 empty, clip. So not only am I going to be able to fire five rounds rapidly, I'm going to reload in a second. Well, my friend over there across the way, my good chap, the Frenchman, 
is standing there, fire, 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 fire. Now he has to reload one round at a time. And then fires five rounds. So the stripper clip is probably one of the things that uh, you want to talk about a technology. One of the things that made World War I deadly is this little piece of metal. The ability to load those weapons instantly and reload. Failing to see that, the United States finally adopts a bolt action rifle. They pick out a design by a Norwegian and they adopt the Craig Jorgensen in 3040. So what's nice about this is the first 30 caliber American weapon. The loading system isn't the Kerparchek. It isn't the stripper. You put the rounds here. You close that, and the circular magazine moves them up. So you're still actually loading it one round at a time. It is outrange by the Spanish Mausers in Cuba. Fortunately for us, the Spanish Mausers are in the hands of Spanish soldiers. <laughs> Otherwise, that could have been a disaster. Just like the Dreyse needle gun was totally outclassed by the Chespo. Bad tactics made the difference. Last gun I'm going to talk about briefly, I'm going back to the Swiss. This is an 1889 Schmidt Rubin. The bad thing about the Schmidt Rubin is when you shoot it, cleaning it's a real bear because you get the sauerkraut and the Thousand Island dressing and roast corned beef in there, and it's really hard to clean. It's a bad joke, sorry. <laughs> What's neat about this is it's a straight pull. We've been turning the bolt. It's an external magazine. The rounds are stacked, alternating. Neat system. I can put 10 rounds in that magazine instead of the typical five. What they don't quite get is it doesn't have a detachable magazine. Their next model will. And it has one of the most odd things of military weapons of this period is called the magazine cutoff. The magazine cutoff is designed that you put your magazine, you load your magazine, and then you keep that in reserve and fire one shot at a time. Well, that makes no sense, I admit. Now, the technology of the straight pull, the concept behind the straight pull, is that if I'm firing, I can keep my face on target. I can keep my eye on the enemy. How practical is it? Not really. I mean, I really don't want to slam my face with a bolt, so I'm going to be turning my face away anyway. Is it much faster than the bolt action? If you look at what the British can do with a mad minute with a bolt action turn bolt end field, no. But let's think a little bit outside the box. Notice the way this works. Pulling here releases the locking mechanism. Pushing forward. You know, if I put a tube coming out of the barrel and capture the gases in the barrel and drive a piston back here to unlock this, maybe then I can put springs back here to push them back. You have the seeds of the automatic weapon in this design and the functionality that's going to come out of it. So, 